Orthodontics at the University of Birmingham, خريج 1997. Uh, معه M. Orth من England uh, 1998. Previous lecturer in Orthodontics at Jordan University. Founder and consultant at uh, Sunna Orthodontics في عمان. طبعا 32 Smiles في Abu Dhabi. Member of the editorial board of the New Jordanian Dental Journal. External examiner at the master program at Just University. He has a number of publications in international journals and lectures. And he lectures extensively in Jordan. طبعا بدي اذكركم انه المحاضرة في عليها ساعات معتمدة. بعد الانتهاء من المحاضرة بس تحط leave meeting بحولك على صفحة نفس المرة الماضية. You can answer the three questions طبعا. وبعدها ان شاء الله you will be able to get your uh, CME. اللي هي one CME. طبعا التنسيق تم مع النقابة. إن شاء الله soon will be done ورح نبعث إحنا e-certificates لكل واحد على إيميله تمام um, I would like to welcome today Dr. Ramon Mompel from Spain Welcome to the Jordanian Orthodontic Society webinar Dr. Ramon Dr. Ramon is an active doctor member of the research team Division Craniofacial Growth and Development Department of Orthodontics at the University of California I'm sorry California, Los Angeles, UCLA, not South Carolina, not South California. <laughs> Advisory professor at Aju University, Seoul, Korea. Advisory professor at Universidad de Coimbra, Portugal. Invited professor at the European University of Valencia, Maurice University, Alcala de Henares University, Spain. Active member of different scientific societies, CEDO, ESOR, AAO, and WFO. He has a master's degree in orthodontics and craniofacial orthopedics from Hospital Fundacion Jiménez Diaz, Madrid, Spain. Uh, university master in integrated dentistry, University Re Juan Carlos, also from Madrid. Clinical residency in the hospital of the University of Coimbra, Portugal. And he's a clinical Invisalign speaker, Diamond 2. We would like to welcome today Dr. Ramon. Hopefully, we will meet you in person uh, soon in the coming future, my friend. Very soon. Welcome. Okay, should I start? Yes, please. please. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And first of all, I would like to thank the whole organization of the Jordanian Orthodontic Society for this uh, invitation to share with you something that I do in my daily, in my daily practice. So today, I'm going to share with you something that, are, that is becoming more and more frequent in our offices, which is the digital orthodontics. And I'm going to share with you some of our advanced protocol. Specifically today, I'm going to talk about four protocols, which are, well, let me see why it doesn't work. One second. It's okay, don't worry, take your time. No, I don't know why this light doesn't go now. One second. Sorry for that. No problem. Uh, if you can shift to the keynote itself. Yeah, I'm trying to do escape, but it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, are you on a Mac or PC? I'm on a Mac. On a Mac, okay. Can you remove the windows away? Okay, it, it's yeah. working. If I, if, I, if I hit the table, it works. So I'll do that. <laughs> Don't <laughs> worry. Perfect. I found a way. <laughs> so. Good. Let's move. Sorry for that. No problem. Go ahead. You already introduced me. I just want to mention that everything you will see today, those protocols, some of them are made in our, in our own office, but most of them has a science base on what we're doing at UCLA, at University of California, Los Angeles. So um, you'll see something that some of them has been proven, but some of them are really, really new. So I want you to see that in a, in a way that some of those protocols you have to see that can be improved proven very, very soon. So today I'm sure some of you are doing some fixed appliance in the traditional way, self ligating, lingual braces. Some of you I'm sure are doing with actually elements like mini implants or functional appliance. And some of them are, some of you are already using aligners in the way that we are using, because you'll see that in my office, I'm 99% an aligner guy. I like to, to use aligners because I think it gives us 
a, a powerful tool to control all our movements, okay? So today, the four protocols that I'm going to share with you is an advanced protocol, MARP plus Invisalign, although I'm using, and you'll see that I will talk about a specific MARP and a specific aligner like Invisalign, you can do those protocols using any kind of MARP and any kind of aligners. I don't have any agreement, not with MSC company, not with Invisalign. I want to make that clear from the very beginning, okay? But I want to share what I do in my office. So I, I will talk about the brands that I use. I'll talk about auto transplantation and Invisalign, how we do and how we implement those digital protocols. We're going to move to talk about mini implants plus Invisalign, some protocols that we also do using the digital way. And we move at the end to talk about airway and fluid dynamics, how we improve, how can we incorporate these digital tools in our daily treatments. So let's start with the very first point, MARP plus Invisalign. So MARP plus Invisalign is a protocol that we are doing already for three years now. And I'm sure you can, you can achieve those kind of treatments. You'll see here some expansion. And here you'll see there's a lot of expansion. However, there's one of them that it hasn't been done with the uh, MSC, with a MARP. If you see closely, the second, the four picture in the first row, starting from the left, it has a hyrax, convection expander. It's not a, it's not a MARP. It doesn't use, uh, it, don't, it doesn't use four mini implants, as you'll see. And I want you to, make, to see these pictures because I will talk about this specific case right now in a, in a few slides. So today I don't have time to talk about what's happening after the expansion and how implement how I implement the aligners into my treatment. But of course, after the expansion, it comes an aligner treatment, also doing in a digital way from the planification to the treatment. But if we are talk, if we are going to talk about a maxillary expansion, we need to become expert in the mid facial tear of the face. Why? Because otherwise we are going to ruin all our expansion. Why? Because most of dentists, most of orthodontics, when we talk about expansion, we only focus, focus on the mid palatal uh, suture, which is not the most resistant suture when we talk about expansion. Instead of this suture, uh, the, the thicum maxillary sutures are those structures that we really need to break. We really need to compete with those structures. Which are they? Those structures are the frontosigomatic suture, the thigomatical maxillary suture, and we need to focus also in the pterygopalatine suture. This suture that is very back in the mouth, in the palate. You can see here in a CVCT view, how can we uh, check those sutures? So first thing, we need to see where's the maxilla. Then we need to focus and we need to know which bones inside the nose, like the bomber, and the edmoids, how they, uh, how they goes when we expand. And of course, we need to know what is the esphenoid plate of the esphenoid bone. You see here how the, the pterygomaxillary pterigo pterigo suture is very important because one reason, whenever we try and whenever we do the maxillary expansion, if we want to protract the maxilla forward, if we want to pull the push the maxilla, pull the maxilla forward, do the, the, the protraction, we need to break somehow this pterygopalatine or pterygomaxillary suture. Otherwise the resistance is going to be so hard. Okay, so this is one structure that we really need to break. Here you can see how it is connected with the rest of the maxilla. So let's move forward to this very first case. This is a case with rapid palatal expansion. This is the way that I used to do my expansion in the old days. So you see here, I place a hyrax, and this is the this is the key. So you see this child has a narrow maxilla, has a bilateral cross bite, anterior open bite. So no doubt that we need to expand this case on the base. We don't need dental expansion. We don't need dental your expansion. We need a skeletal expansion. So what we do in those cases? Well, in those cases, what I used to do it in those days were I place my hyrax expander, I do the expansion, and then I wait for the second phase. So if, I, if you check those pictures, if I move forward, 
And I ask you to see those pictures. If you compare the pre and the post expansion, I'm sure you see those, this case now and say, well, it's a pretty easy case now. You only need to play some braces and do the second phase and the treatment will be perfectly, perfectly done in 18 months. However, if we look close to the face of this kid, after three years, the face is still the same. What, what does that mean? That means that I haven't done anything related to the airway. So I have the tool and you'll see how with the MRP, we are able to expand not only the maxilla in the lower connected to the mouth, but also in the upper maxilla where the airway comes. So we need to, uh, we need to check the airway in every single treatment because we are orthodontists and we can treat airway if we do it in the right way. Because in this case, it was for me, it was a totally success for ortho, totally failed for medical reasons. So I haven't improved his airway. And why? Because the regular, the normal expansion is done in this way. When we talk in a frontal, in a, in a coronal plane, the resistance will be the frontal sigma, the frontal nasal suture. And when we talk in an actual plane, this terigo maxillary suture that I've been talking about is gonna be our main resistance. So we need to focus in those two resistance as well. So let's move to this. If we talk about expansion and we use a regular plate, our expansion is gonna be dental. We are not gonna get any kind of expansion but dental. If we use a dental, a dental support um, um, expander, then we are going to be able to have a little alveolar effect, okay? Dental alveolar effect. So we decided to go more. Okay, let's place a hyrax. If we had a hyrax, we are going to start having a small skeletal base expansion. Sometimes we are going to get a really parallel split, but some cases we are not going to be able to get this parallel split that I will show you. That's why it comes the idea of a MARPI. The MARPI is the combination of a regular hyrax, placing four mini implants, two mini implants, different designs that I want, that I want to share with you. You see here, there's some designs. So if we, do, if we use this kind of designs where it has two mini implants in the anterior part of the maxilla, most of the cases, or not, not most of the cases, but some of, case, of the cases, we are going to have not a really good and quality expansion. We can have quantity expansion. Why? Because we are going to have dental alveolar effect, but not always a basal bone effect. That's why I always like to talk about, in this case, the expander that I use. That is the maxillary skeletal expander developed by the Toe One Moon, but it's a expander that I want to make clear that it's a good expander because it has two points. It uses four mini implants and it promotes the bicortical engagement. So any expander that you use that has four mini implants and has bicortical engagement and you place in the way that I'm going to show you, I guarantee that the expansion is going to be successful Maybe it's not successful because of biological, biological reason of the patient. I will show you. So this is the kind of expansion that we want to get. Really, really parallel. And why is this? Look at these images. If we use too many implants in the anterior part, this is, going, this is what is going to happen. So we are going to place them. We have a first cortical, which is the maxillary cortical bone. We are going to have a second lawyer, which is the nasal cortical in the maxilla, and then our mini implants are going to place in that position. That's why we are not going to be able to achieve the bicortical engagement. So our successful rate is going to decrease. We can do something. Why don't we use thicker and longer mini implants? We can do it, and maybe we can have this bicortical engagement. That's why we decided to move for four mini implants. What happened if we use, like in this case, like in the image on the left, upper left that you'll see, that you are seeing, if we use these mini implants, if they are too short, we are not gonna get that bicortical engagement. That's why we need to use a MARPI that promotes four mini implants and bicortical engagement. It's a critical, critical point. That's why I always like to defer and differentiate between MARPI and MSC. MSC, has those two components of bicortical and four mini implants. 
Why? Because we want to get this kind of expansion. This is the cadaver study that we are doing now in Spain with Dr. Moon and my brother, uh, Dr. Juan Moon, and my brother, Dr. Jose Luis Montpel. He's oral surgeon. He works with me. And you see here how this is a nasal cut, axial, axial nasal cut, and you'll see and you see how the mini implants goes up to the nose. Here you see in the in the study. And if you compare these two images, you can see how in the left with the MSC, we get this really beautiful parallel expansion in 3D way, in the in a 3D position. Why? Because if you look in the red in the right side, uh, you see we don't have this perfect split. We always focus and we if we only look at the mouth, we are evaluate the quantity of expansion. But we really need to make sure we are getting not only quantity, but quality, okay? You see here, if we compare and we do the superimposition between the pre and the post, you see how we can get these pterygo plates, these are frontal cut, and the pterygo plates, red before, yellow after, you see how we can split also the back part of the maxilla, which means we are going to be able to protract the maxilla forward. Okay, again, you can see here how we can check the pterygopath in suture. You see how we split perfectly well. In the left is the pre and the right is the after. So those are some tools that we can do using, of course, CVCT. If you have more interest in this uh, kind of expansion, you can check in many articles that we have, many people have, so you can check. So this is the idea. The idea is to expand the maxilla, wait three months until we get the, fill, the, bone, the bone refill the, the gap, and then we can start closing everything. A cortical engagement, remember? You see here how we can check with the CVCT how we can get this by cortical engagement. So indication, you already know. So only we are going to use MARPI in case of skeletal maxilla incorporations and dolicofacial patients. Why? Because we are going to get really parallel. So the parting cusp of the upper molars, they are not going to go down. So our open, the, our mandible is not going to open. That's why we use this kind of MARPI in dolicofacial patients. And again, you see here, I place sleep apnea patient. Now the MSC has been proved to be a device that can improve sleep apnea patient. So we are using for that purpose. And also in adults patient, we have demonstrated that we can, it has been demonstrated that the suture, the mid suture, in, it never fuses. So if we active the expander in the proper way, and if we place the MSC in the proper place, we are going to be able to split. Where, when are we, we are not going to use the MARPI, we are not going to use, if, of course, if we want to do a dentio alveolar expansion, if the nose is really wide, we need to be careful because we are going to get a little of soft tissue in the nose improvement. So make sure you want to span a little and we cannot use in very narrow palates. And let's go digital, okay? How do we design the MEC to be successful? That's the question. We have two ways. We can do an analog MSC and we can do, do, do a digital MSC. If we do in the analog way, let me tell you that we need a lot of visits for the patient. So the patient will need to come to my, to my office first time for taking conventional records. Then we are going to treatment, to explain the treatment for my patient. The third appointment will be to place the spacers in order to place the bands in a future appointment. So four visits for my patient placement of the bands and pick up impression for the lab. And then in the fifth appointment, I'm going to be able to place my MSC. And in between, I have the lab manufacture uh, work. So if we do this, what are we gonna do in the MSC analog way? Okay, the lab, I have to place the bands with the um, cast model. I'm going to draw the mid paddle suture I'm doing it in the analog way. This is the way that we are normally do, okay? And then I will move to the digital way. So normally we have the cast model. We have to draw this mid pattern suture. We have to draw the hard palate and the soft palate uh, limit. 
and we are going to place our MSC body. Normally, we always recommend to place the MSC right in the first molars. We are not doing that anymore, and I will show you why. Then the lab has to do the bend of the arms and do the soldering work. But can we trust any of these points? In my opinion, none of them are really trustable, okay? Because we want to do predictable treatments. Why? Because we want to avoid this kind of uh, failures. So some adverse effects that we normally have, if you are doing, and if you do MARP in the office, I'm sure you see those kind of side effects. So sometimes we get this impeachment on the soft mucosa. Sometimes it doesn't split at the beginning. Sometimes it bends. So we want to avoid this. That's why, if you ask me, how can we have warranties of success? Only if we do a digital design. How do we do a digital design in this case? Okay, if we do a digital design, we are going to be able of three things. First thing, we are going to be able of having of have control over the virtual design. So we are going to place our MSC virtually in the perfect position. Second thing that I can warranty you with the digital design, we can have control over the intraoral installation of the MSC. That means when that means that when the MSC comes to my office, the digital MSC comes to my office, it's gonna have only one position in mouth. Why? Because I'm going to use centralized structures in the bands. So I'm not gonna use bands. So it only, it only has one position. Because if I start pushing my bands for my patient, it can be tilted. So I can ruin all my lab work. That's why we, we can have control over the literal installation just by having one position in mouth. But I have, a, um, I have a, a control over the patient biological characteristics I cannot have control of this. That means if the patient has 40 years old, I cannot do anything. I need to improve. I need to make some extra things in order to improve my rate of sex. Okay, but we can have control over the first two things, which is not which is not a, a nothing. It's a lot. So I move from MSC to digital MSC. What do we need to do digital MSC? First thing, that's my question. Are we ready to practice digital dentistry? Because if we do digital, let me see, see what we have. We can do a first appointment. We need to take records, including STL files and the DICOMS files. Second appointments will be to explain the treatment for my patient. And in my third appointment, I'm going to be able to place the, uh, to deliver the MEC. And the work will be so simple because the lab just need some of my files. Let me share with you how do we do the um, digital MSC. First thing, we need to take and we need the STL files and we need the DICOM files. Those files come from an intro scanner and a CVCT. I always like to talk about this because when we start doing digital ortho, we normally talk to, my, to the lab and say, I'm sending you my scanner. What's the scanner means? Are you sending me your STL files, your DICOM files? Are you sending me the machine, the CVCT machine? So we need to talk with property. So STL files and DICOM files, okay? So once we have the STL files and the DICOM files, we are going to superimpose those structures together to get only one model. Once I have the superimposition, I'm going to establish the three, the, the three planes because I will need to place my MSC in the right position, okay? So this plane is not, is not anymore a line, it's a plane. It's my frontal coronal plane. And then once I place this MSC in position, I need to place in the vertical position. Look here. I have here the palatal mucosa line in yellow. The, the white line, sorry, the white plane, it's a plane, it's not a line, but you see here in a line, the, the white line is the mid sagittal plane, okay? So palatal mucosa, and then I have two more planes. I have the MSC plane and the palatal plane, okay? Those two planes has to be perpendicular to the mid sagittal plane. Why? And I, I don't want to talk too much into planes and because it can be, it can be very, very confusing. 
The thing is that, that I need to be these three planes, two planes, blue and green has to be perpendicular to the white because I want to make sure that I have too many implants in the right side and too many implants in the left side. If you look closely, I want to make this. I want to rotate and see that I have, this is a nasal view, two on the right, two on the left. How do I do this? I need to make sure that I put my MSC in place because if I go, sorry, let me go back one slide. Okay, here. If you see, I have to check where's the MSC touching the maxilla because normally when we have a model, a cast, a model cast, if we put the MSC flush to the palate, my MSC is gonna be tilted, right? So my forming implants can be positioned in this way. And instead of being perpendicular, I'm going to be like this. So we need to make sure that my MSC is parallel to the nasal plane, to the uh, palatal plane and perpendicular to the mid sagittal plane. Okay? So we want to have these kind of images. Why? Because when I get this, I can see, okay, if I place my MSC in that position um, and I use 30 millimeters mini implants, I know that I have minimum, I have length enough in the posterior, but in the anterior, I'm a little too short. That's why I need to move and play with my MSC in order to place it in the right position. What I'm gonna do, I'm going to place, to play, to play not only with the forward and backward, but also with the inclination of my MSC. If you see here, what I'm doing, I'm putting my posterior part of the MSC, it goes down. Why? Because I want to make bicortical engagement in my interior. So look how it goes. I don't have anterior bicortical engage, so I go inside and I see that I need a little more. That's why I come here with the red and I change my inclination until I see that I have my bicortical engage. See that I'm having a little of bicortical engagement? And that's why we need to play until we get this bicortical engagement. Finally, we can design our structures since it's gonna be, they're gonna be uh, centralized. We can make any kind of hooks. In my case, I like to do two hooks, for example, for class three patient because I, owe, I normally place face masks for patient and also anterior lower mini plates, as you will see in one of my cases. So that's why I have two hooks. And I'm sure they are not going to be desoldered because it's only one piece. So I'm not going to be at these hooks coming off that makes our life terrible. So this is how the MEC comes the, from, the, from the lab. And as I said, we only have one position in mouth. Today, I don't have a lot of time because uh, I will show you in a, in, a, in a different lecture in the future. You see in the model, if you look closely, there's an acrylic part that it's between the palate and the MSC. This is the, the gap that it has between the maxilla and the MSC once I place by, uh, virtually. So this is something that I will share with you in a future presentation with more time. Here is, you see one piece and it plays in mouth. What happened when we don't have access or adult patient? We do the cortical punctions. Cortical punctions, as you see here, is in the cadaver study. We do small holes in order to make mini fractures along the mid palatal suture, trying to, to reduce the resistance of the mid palatal suture. You see this, this is in the cadaver study, but you have always have to use a lot of irrigation. Otherwise, you can make some necrosis of the bone. So always with a lot of irrigation. You can do with the MSC in place or without the MSC. If you know from the beginning that your patient has a lot of much, has a mature bone and the resistance is going to be really, really hard to split, what I recommend to you is to use some digital guides that we do because we, want, we, we are going to do this from the very beginning even before the first MSC. So we're going to get the guide, we're going to place in mouth, and then we can only follow the holes that we did using the CVCT in order to make those holes, okay? So if you know from the beginning that you will need to split or it's going to be hard, 
my recommendation is to use the guides and do the cortical functions before the first placement of the MFC. Again, with irrigation. So let me explain this case is really, really fast, just to see and just to show you how really accurate can be the expansions if we do with this protocol. So if we get this patient, you see, let me, let me see if it goes, okay. So here you see only in three weeks, we are going to open, okay? You see how we open? Of course, then we need to close, but what I want you to see is how parallel the split was. And this is because we use it, this digital guide, okay? Here you see how, it, how with aligners we have, oh, sorry, with aligners, we have a really good tool that we can put this in the, we can put, a, we can add, as you see in the, in the last row, we can add this uh, fake tooth to make our patient happy. That's something that is really easy with aligners and uh, is one of the advantages of using aligners. This is the protocol that I use because I normally use, I have a protocol that combines everything together, which is the MC, aligners, anterior lower mini-plates. I do everything together in order to save some time for my patient. You see here how we can check and how we can measure how much expansion we need. Again, this is the case where we check our bicotical engagement and that's it. So you see how parallel we can be if we use digital designs. Then we close the gap as you see here and then we can start the protraction. That's why you see there's two anterior lower mini plates. I would like to share this case with you in a future presentation with more time. But if you see those mini plates, those mini plates are also placed using digital guides. We have an acrylic, we have, sorry, we have a guide, incisal guide that we place in the, in the edge of the lower incisor, just to make the surgeon to make a small cut and place the mini implants to secure the, the, the mini plate. So we don't do anything without using guides anymore. Sometimes we place some mini implants and if we don't have time, we don't place it. But if we can and we have time and we plan everything, we use the digital uh, tools, okay? Talking about mini plates, you can use any mini plates. There's many different ways of doing it. Okay, here you see with the aligners, with the gap closed. Here you see the mini plates. As I said, there's many brands of mini plates. Okay, I like those, which are from a, a company that for orthognatic surgery, very cheap and very convenient. Okay, just make sure this is placed also with a guide because it's gonna give you a lot of uh, peace because when you are playing and when you're positioning mini implants between the lower incisor, incisors roots, you need to be, to be sure that you don't touch those roots. Okay, and again, in this case, see how much improvement we get in the, uh, with the index apnea, hypopnea index. So, okay, it goes from 18.5 to 4.0 uh, in just three weeks. Just to finish with MRP and Invisalign, I want to uh, show you how accurate we can be. We use um, tools and we use a clinical, like the clean check in Invisalign, we can see how we can move and we can check dental movements and then and skeletal movement. In blue, dental, in yellow, those are the skeletal movements. So every time, that is a really frequent question when I talk about Invisalign, every time that we see and we hear virtual jump, that means a skeletal change, okay? Virtual jump means a skeletal change. So any movement that you see in your clean check that moves like, like in a jump, that's mean skeletal. So you need to be sure that you are gaining these skeletal chains. Otherwise, it's not gonna be a successful treatment. This is, as I said, the protocol that we have, it's an active expansion. So it's how we combine the MSC with aligners, okay? But I want to show you just to, know, to let you know that there's a way of doing this protocol using also aligners. So let's move now to the second advanced protocol, autotransplantation plus aligners. So 
something that we are doing now in our office is not to extract teeth, to teeth that maybe they can be used in a different position in mouth. This is the autotransplantation, using one tooth of a patient and put in a different position, okay? So here we have this guy. This guy, I'm going to show you how he bites. So his occlusion, sorry, as it goes. Well, you'll see now, uh, I'm waiting for the slide to go, okay. Oh, okay. You see here, and I want you to see, I want you to focus in the second quadrant. If you go to the second quadrant, you can see there's a mini canine, which is a supernumerary tooth in that position. And if you look closely, you'll see this uh, second upper left premolar in a position of 2.5 that has something strange. So let's go to the CVCT. Okay, if we go to the CVCT, we can now see that we have an impact, upper left impact canine. We have a supernumerary tooth in his position. And then we have a premolar with another premolar, another supernumerary super tooth attached fuse to that root, okay? So treatment plan can be many of treatment plans. We can extract the supernumerary canine and protract and do the traction of the canine. We can extract the premolar and do the mesialization of the upper molars in the left. And we can do many kinds of treatment, but something that we all want is to make our treatment, and that's my recommendation, as simple as possible. So if we want to make this treatment very, very simple. I, I'm sure you will you agree with me that, that's, that this treatment that I'm going to show you, share with you, it can be one of the simplest one. So we decided to remove that uh, premolar with the other supernumerarius because we tried to do a, a, a different dentist, tried to do several times a root canal treatment with unsuccessful results. So we decided to extract. Then we're going to extract the canine, put that canine in the position of the premolar, do our ortho treatment, and then place a crown. Very, very simple, okay? Of course, we need ortho not only for a small movement, but to establish a nice occlusion. So let's see how we do and how we plan this autotransplantation in a digital way to uh, secure and to make sure and warranty that our rate of success is high. So here you see how we have this premolar in map. First thing, we remove it. So if we remove the premolar, you see how we have this um, root canal treatment tried, it didn't work. So we made the good decision of a strat that tooth. This is a defect that we have before, uh, after the extraction, okay? Huge defect of bone, bone defect. And here is the key. So when we talk about autotransplantation, there's one key, critical factor, okay? The critical factor is the extra alveolar time of the autotransplanted auto tooth. That's mean the less time the tooth, the autotransplanted tooth, is in the extra, extra alveolar time, the better it will be. So less time, the better it will be. So what we do in order to achieve this, we do what we call a replica. You see, there's acrylic tooth in the left side of the screen. This is a tooth that we do for check the, the position of the tooth. Let me explain you this better. So this replica is done. You have a CVCT with your canine in mouth. We are going to isolate that images. How? We can use many software to isolate that uh, tooth, single tooth. We are going to print in acrylic that tooth. So we have this tooth, acrylic, this acrylic tooth in my mouth. Canine is still in place, it's still in the mouth. What I want is to try that acrylic tooth in the alveolar hole after destruction. And I, I will not extract my canine until I'm sure my replica is perfectly well adapted because I will remove my canine and put right in place. One second, no, no extra time at all. It will be just for the picture. So five seconds for the picture if you want to have a picture. Otherwise it will go really, really nice. And this is something that you as an orthodontist has to explain to your oral surgeon. Otherwise 
your oral surgeon is going to remove the tooth, put in a bug, put in a, in a, in a, in a bowl, and make the whole made extraction. And that makes your life really, really complicated. Because after all, you won't be able to move your autotransplanted tooth. And remember that you need to do an ortho treatment after. Okay? So here you see how we take the mini, how we take the canine after take the replica, put in place. We need, of course, to cut the tip of the, of the canine and we fill with autologous bone of the same patient. We fill the defect of the bone. We need to hold that uh, graft, bone graft with a titanium mesh. And then we do the fertilization of the autotransplanted tooth. You see here, I normally go to these sessions because I want to do the fertilization my own. Because if you leave the fertilization to the oral surgeons, they are not really well trained to do fertilization. So it comes with a lot of composite and everything comes a mess. So it's better if you go with your, with your oral surgeon and you do the bonding yourself. This case was done by the oral surgeon, the autotransplanted tooth. When do we do the uh, root canal treatment? After one week. So after one week, we procedure, we do the procedure of the root canal. If it's a, a young teeth with open apex, we don't need to do the root canal treatment. After one week, you, you still see how we remove, after three months, we remove the fertilization and we are ready now to do the ortho treatment. You see here how we have this uh, maxilla, that's the beginning of my patient. Okay, so this 25 is not a 25 anymore. It's my canine. So see how simple the case is gonna be. So this is my maxilla. I just need to expand, do the correlation between the upper and the lower arch and that with everything. So it will be a very, very simple case that could be really, really hard at the beginning. Okay. So here you see how we establish the, our anchorage. That's more a liner stain to in order to do the expansion in the anterior area of the maxilla. And I can, using aligners, again, digital treatment, I can make my tooth uh, without moving. So I can make sure that tooth is not gonna be moving. That's something that again, you need to talk to your oral surgeon because you want him, you want him to place the autotransplanted tooth in the best position as possible. That's mean in the last position where you want to finish with your tooth, okay? So make that, uh, place that in your mind. So here, you see, I only have those progress. So you can see how it becomes really, really simple case, okay? Of aligning, aligning and leveling case. So no much, no, no, not too much complication. Okay, let me talk how we do now, how we place mini implants using digital uh, guides. In this case, for example, when you have cases that you need to remove or you have a, a, a missing a second premolars, what we do, we mesialize sometimes the, the, the lower molars. How do we do? Okay, we place a mini implants, as you see here in the acrylic, between, for example, the three and the four. And what we want to do is a, Centralize a structure with a hook in order to do the protraction of the lower molars. Why? Because if you try to do this with a band and a handmade hook, it will hit the, the, the gingiva and it will hurt a lot and sometimes come off. That's why we want to make a single structure, really a hard structure. And we can also make sure that the center of rotation of the molar will go straight to the mini implant so we can have a really uh, in mass movement of those molars. We can also make sure that hook doesn't touch the gingiva. You see those two structures. And you can design any kind of hooks you want. You can design with a uh, more hook, uh, everything you want. So this is how it comes from the lab. I always like to place a small pad for the seven I know my seven will follow my six because of the, of the suture, but 
uh, because of the filament, sorry, uh, intra um, periodontal ligament. But I always like to have this part on the seven just bonded to follow or to have more uh, rate of success when I do the protraction of my molars. And this structure, I'm going to bond on my patient, one of its side, okay? My computer is thinking, it's getting tired of my computer. <laughs> so you see here how it comes from the lab with the acrylic, okay? So I put this on place, I bond to my patient with any, for example, a, a, any, any kind of bond, okay? And you can make sure your center of rotation will be in the position you establish virtually. Okay, and then the only thing that you have to do is to plan, you do the extraction of the molars. Okay, then you place your synthesized structures, as you see here, and then you just need to tell the patient to wear rubber bands, elastics. Why? Because it will give us, every day it has this, the right force, the right strength in order to mesialize those molars. And of course, we can start the treatment with aligners in the anterior play, in the anterior place. Again, digital is here to help us and make our, our treatments simple, more simple. Okay. See so here how we can place the elastics to close those gaps. You see here. I think I have here the clean tech. I'm not sure if I add in this presentation because again, when we talk about aligners, in this case, we are going to remove in our clean tech, we are going to remove of the treatment plan, the molars. I don't want to have my molars, the molars you see here. So in my first attempt, I included the molars. So I got that clean tech, I realized all the treatment, but I decided not to include the molars in order uh, to protract the molars. Instead of this, I decided to remove it and have this. Let me show you. So without molars. So I can plan, why? Because I don't need aligners in the lower posterior. I will include them at the end to have my root, root control and everything very, very well done. Okay, but you can remove, remove from the beginning of the treatment so you will reduce from 90, 77 aligners that I have in my first attempt to 27. So that comes a treatment of 18 months and it always be dependent on the molar protection, okay? Something really, really important. Talking about mini implants, how do we do the placements of a simple mini implant, for example, here between the four and the three, we can do manually or we can use a digital guide. How do we do? Here, for example, is an impact canine. You see here how we place the hook, how we place the elastic through the um, upper aligner with a hole. That's more, that's another, another topic. Okay, but I want you to see how we make those guides. So we are again going to have our CVCT of the mandible. We have our STL file. And the only thing that I need is to place my mini implant virtually. Once I have my mini implants virtually avoiding the roots, I can make my guide, my virtual guide, according to the system of the mini implants that I use in my office. Okay, so this guide is made for a specific mini implant. Okay, so you always need to share with your lab which kind of brand, which brand you use for them to make a guide with the proper uh, size, okay? Otherwise, it will not come your your hand drive. It will it, a hand driver. It will it won't come through the guide, okay? And it's very simple. Anyone can place these mini implants, right? So no more uh, fair to place mini implants. And to finish these eight last minutes that I have, I want to show you how we do and how we implement this digital way, these digital tools in the airway. When we talk about airway, normally people uh, show um, a static to a static measurement. So they show you this. This is what? 
This is a virtual reconstruction of the airway. This is a static uh, measurement. Okay, it hasn't. It doesn't tell me how my patient breathes. It only tells me if my patient has a big airway or a small airway. That's the only information that I have. Okay, again, if I show you those this video, I'll show you how this is a frontal view. So we are going to the nostril, okay? And then we are going to face the pharynx. Okay, we are going through the nasal, nasal airway, nasal path, and then we are watching the pharynx. You see the epiglottis, this is the pre and this is the post of expansion. Okay, let me show you one more time. So I go through the nose, okay? And if you see here, again, there's something. Okay, it goes. So if you see here, that's a static for a measurement. Again, I'm not telling you how my patient breathes. And if you want to see, and if you want to check if your patient, it has any improvement in the airway, for example, after expansion, you need to implement some dynamics uh, measurements. Okay, that's mean we need to make sure and we need to measure how my patient breathes. Subjective measurements. That's why we need to do this fluid dynamics measurement. So here you see a reconstruction of the airway and we implement some airway through the nose to see how my patient breathes. Okay, this is more complex uh, tools. We also need an engineer to implement those, but we can see where are those um, resistant in the airway. You see in red, where are those resistant? Also, we can play and we can uh, simulate the vibration of the soft palate. And we can also check here again with this fluid dynamics. So for concluding my presentation today with all of you, I only have two conclusions. So professional experience is very, very important. It's what makes you a really good orthodontist. You need to do a lot of cases you need to improve day, day by day. So professional experience will be always the big point that we always, that we, if we work hard, we all gonna achieve in a future. But if we talk about data, there's something that I want to share with you, that is training. We can train and we can practice the digital way. We can practice ourselves by doing digital things, not necessarily in a patient. That means we can become really good on detail. We can become really good planners, diagnosis. We can do a really good diagnosis because we can become really good at digital, that and only by training. So we don't need years, years, and years of practice to become really good digital orthodontist. So that's my last slide. If everything was easy, anyone would make it. So I force you, empower you, to become digital and work hard every day to make uh, your uh, office better. If anyone has um, a more interest in mini implants, we have this course with Dr. Wong Moon. And in aligners, we have, I have a course with Dr. Kenji Ojima. It doesn't come, sorry. Okay, this is the course with Dr. Ken Yojima on aligners. So if anyone has any interest, this is our site, okay, Formacion Dentalgram. We are trying to do everything online as we are doing today because days are changing, but hopefully we can meet face-to-face -face very, very soon. If any of you have has some question, please let me know and I'll more than happy to answer all of your question. Oh, sorry, it didn't, let me show you. <clears throat> Okay, here you have. So thank you one more time, one more time for your time, and I hope you enjoyed my my lecture. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Ramon. What an amazing lecture! Uh, very, uh, very informative. I'm sure our uh, participants have a lot of questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, if if I may, Majdu uh, Shadi, start with the questions. Yes, uh, yes, please. Yes, there's, there's an interesting question from uh, Dr. Bara uh, Hanande about stability. And the question is for you, Dr. Ramon, is there, are there any long-term comparative studies 
on stability between MARP, RME, or the Ultramic, where you you expand and then retract again and again. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, there's stability basically. Yeah, think. yeah. There's some there's some studies where shows the difference between MARP and between uh, between um, conventional expansion and MARP expansion. Okay, but inside a uh, MARP expansion, we have again to defer between one MARP and the other MARP and we need to defer about the protocol, like Alramec protocol, because Alramec protocols uh, promotes open and close in order to break the technical part in suture and make the parallel split, okay? The thing when we talk about stability is if you can get a really parallel split, your stabilization, your stabilization will be much better. Why? Because if you do an expansion like this, okay, your two M maxillas will go back. I always, when we talk about stabilization, I always use a Dr. Moon example. He always talk about a curtain. So you have a bar with two curtains. If you do conventional expansion, your expansion will be like taking the two curtains will be like this. Whenever you drop, it will go back. Okay, if you do with a hyrax, it will be like this with the two curtains. You move fast. So the two curtains will be like this a little, and then it will go back. But if you do expansion with Marpy, it will be the same as cutting the bar and move like this. So no relapse. So if you want to make sure you don't have relapse, you need to establish a really well occlusion. So your occlusion will define your stabilization. Excellent. Uh, I, I hope Dr. Hernandez uh, answers your question. Uh, we're still uh, receiving more questions. And in the meantime, Dr. Ramon, I, I love the idea of the cast uh, band that you used for protracting molars. I have a little suggestion for you. If, if we can go back to the slide. Yeah, I can go back. If you can, just for the benefit of everybody. Yeah, I, I like uh, I like every every input you can make me. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's, uh, it's, it's a great idea because for me personally, it's always been difficult with these and, and this is a, a lovely way yeah. out this now, one yeah there, there's there's a one clinically that you've shown but that's fine basically the the question is you've um, overcome uh, tipping by placing the uh, protraction force at as close as possible to the center of rotation that's great mm -hmm. but the molar will rotate so wouldn't it be nice if you had another casted hook on the inside, on the palatal side, so that you can alternate between buccal palatal, buccal palatal as that molar comes in, therefore controlling the tooth in that dimension as well. Yeah, that, that's a great question and a great suggestion. Uh, the thing that I'm not using it is because I assume that I will have some rotation itself, mm -hmm. but I will improve, I will control that with my aligner at the end of the treatment. Why? Because I don't want to place another hook and make my patient to wear another uh, elastic inside. So it will make my patient re re a little more hard. But in the maxilla, for example, I always use vestibular implant, palatal implant, and two hooks. Why? Because the, uh, the, um, the, um, the bone in the maxilla is softer. So my molars rotate really, really fast along mm -hmm. the palatal root. That's why in the upper, I always do. In the lower arch, I normally don't do, but it's true that sometimes I can ha have really huge rotation. So yeah. great suggestion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There's a, there's a question from uh, Abdullah Al-Huli. Uh, what is your expansion protocol? He, he, and there's a follow-up question, like activation per day. And I'm assuming, okay. Dr. Abdullah, you mean the, uh, the MSC. So what okay, is yeah. Protocol? My activation protocol, uh, it really depends on the patient. That would be the question. That would be the answer. But to give you a better answer, more specific, I will, I will do, I always do minimum one millimeter per day. So I don't like to talk about turns because it really depends on the expander you use because some of, some of them, four turns means one millimeter. In the MSC2, for example, six turns, it means one millimeter. So I always like to talk about millimeters. So one millimeter minimum per day. Once you get the expansion and you have clinical, you can make sure that you have a, a split, then you can reduce your protocol as minimum as you want. So you can do one turn per day if you want. So 
you, since it's a rapid palatal expansion, you need to go minimum one millimeter, especially if you are if you are in adult patient. If I always do a one week appointment after I place the MSC, after one week my patient comes to my office. Office, if I don't see any clinical um, thing that makes me think that I have the split, I increase the number of turns. Mm -hmm. so That's one, what I do. So normally point. with the MSC, which is six millimeter, six turns one millimeters, what I do is between five and six millimeter one week. And if, you don't, if I don't get the split, then I go up to eight, nine turns per, per day. Wow. And, and uh, Ramon, why do you insist on a bicortical engagement for, for your expansion? Uh, I mean, surely a single cortical engagement has enough um, retention of the, uh, of the implants and you will get that expansion. Why are you insisting on bicortical? Yeah, I insist in bicortical because if you don't get bicortical and you have a hard tissue, hard bone, then your mini implants are going to tilt for sure. Especially okay. sometimes what you have, even when you have bicortical engagement, your mini implants, sometimes they drag through the bone. So you don't get the expansion and they cut the bone and you finally don't get the expansion. Those cases are where you need to do those cortical punctures in order to break the mid pattern suture. So the idea of bicortical is in order to avoid the tipping of the mini implants. Because if you get the tip of the mini implants, then you can get the expansion, but it's going to be harder. In young patients, young patients, it is true that if you don't get the bicortical, it can work. It can work very well. And if you don't use four mini implants and you only use two mini implants, it can work also. But why you want to take that risk? So always be bicortical, and every time you can, use four mini implants. Right. So bicortical, four mini implants, and maybe the cuts as well in adult patients just to release that suture a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, one question could be to say, to see that when, when do you consider your patient adult? Because we are talking about mature bone, not, yeah. not age. But clinically, it's very, very hard. You can make Hunsuf, Hunsuf, uh, units and everything, but it makes your life really, really hard. So my recommendation would be after 30 years old, in man, men, I always do the cortical punctures. Over 30 years old, I see I got more resistant after that age. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Halhouli, that probably answers your question. I know there's another question. What is the age limit that we could use MSC for patients? So I, I believe you've just answered that one. So basically, Dr. Halhouli, any any age? Am I right? Age. From one and, age, yeah. and after 30, you probably will go for the cuts as well. Um, there's a question from Dr. Bora again. Does this uh, parallel expansion cause more nasal deformity, especially in younger patients, as we have one vomer bone that will move? So we talk about nasal deformity, Ramon. Does it, uh, Dr. Ramon? Yeah, we have several studies done at UCLA talking about soft tissue uh, change after the expansion. The truth, the truth is that we don't get a lot of soft tissue changes. We have uh, of a, in a 10 millimeters expansion, we only have one millimeter per site, which the patient don't see. Patients don't see that differ difference between before and after. But that's one question about soft tissue. But if we look inside the nose, it is true that we have a bomber and the edmoid, okay? The, the nasal septum. So nasal septum, um, until now, we cannot make sure where it will go. So you know those sticks, that is a stick and has two ends, the lucky sticks that you pull and one of the sides will go with the longer stick and the other has the short one. So when we do the split, the nasal septum will be always connected to one of emi maxilla. But we cannot make sure if the nasal septum will go to the right side or to the left side, okay? So that's why if we have a deviated nasal septum, some cases, some cases get worse. Some of them get really, really straight. So if you want to make sure, and you want to make some uh, impact in the nasal septum, you have to do a nasal septum cut uh, with the oral surgeon, with the ENT, sorry, uh, ENT guy. You have to do a perform the cut in the nasal septum in order to make the, make the, the, the stick cut right here. So you don't get any kind of effect in the nasal septum. 
Do you have cases where you had to do some nasal reconstructive surgery? Post no. No. No, I have I have cases, but because I have a lot of ENT refers patients to my office. So I do the expansion and then I'm not worried about where the nasal septum goes because I know the ENT has to go inside the nose. So he will uh, remodelate everything. So that's why I'm not really into know where the septum goes because I will do the expansion and then my ENT will fix it if he, if he, if he went to the wrong side. Right, right. But it will, be, it will be very, very nice if we can somehow know where the nasal septum will go. Right, right. I know. I know this protocol is relatively new, but there are, are there any ongoing research to um, to put some numbers on this? There's like some evidence evidence based um, uh, research ongoing or past papers or anything. Yeah, we are we are we are working on this at UCLA. I have Alberta University. They have some papers published. Okay, but as I said, it has only two three cases, so we cannot talk about we cannot yeah. talk about science evidence based on three cases. Yeah. That's why I cannot uh, tell you in a really straight way, it will go right or it will go to the left. We don't know yet. That's fa fascinating research. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, personal question for me now. Uh, what, what, what are these nice softwares that you're using? They, the, I noticed there's one to merge the DICOM and the STL file. Mm -hmm. And the second one uh, you had for guides for the mini implants. We have developed our own software. It's made by us. So, and the lab that I work with, they have their own software. Uh, it calls Primate, P R I M A T E. Uh, I think you, it's not for, they don't sell the software, but you can do with any software. There's many software where you can do that. There's free software like um, uh, Blue Sky. Blue Sky is a free software where you can do all things. Of this and uh, Mesh Misher is also another really nice software. And um, for CVCT, I like to do for the superimposition, I like to use On Demand. On Demand is a Korean brand and it's very, very nice uh, software because it does the superimposition in one second. And the superimposition is based on the anterior cranial base and it oh. doesn't do the match uh, based on landmarks. It does the match between the pre and the post CVCT based on a, on a, on bone, so only on the structure. So it doesn't take landmarks. So only by taking the surface surface point, sorry, surface reconstruction. So it makes a really accurate superimposition automatically, on right. demand. Is on demand and, and max measure. Yeah. The, the one that produces the templates for TADS is. This is the primate yes. one. It's the private one, but you can do with mesh measure and blue sky. Blue sky is a nice software. It's a free access. You can download and you can do everything. Yes. Although it's a, it's a little complex because you have to spend time using it, but it has every single tool. Right, right. Really nice. I like. Can I ask Dr. Samer uh, so now? Yes, of course, please. Okay. Actually, I have a comment and I have, and I have some questions because I am using Marty for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, the first comment about the anterior meniscus in the, in the palate. In the uh, diagram, you show us that it is uh, maybe impossible to, to, to get bicortical anchorage from the anterior uh, meniscus. And actually, in the diagram, you put the direction of the meniscus is tilted anteriorly toward the uh, roots of the incisors. And I think just uh, simply by changing the angulation of the insertion, you can get easily the bicortical uh, anchorage. And actually, we are not doing it in this way because simply you will hit the roots of the lateral incisors of the if you, if you angulate it uh, toward the, the, the roots, especially if the laterals are already proclined. So you do, will not have uh, enough space. So it's better to, to make it uh, actually perpendicular to the palatal plane, not to the bone. And by this, you can easily uh, avoid the roots and get the bicortical uh, anchor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question, my question is about two things. The first one about the retention protocol for the, the MARP, what you are using and for how long. And uh, the second question for the, the nasal deformity. 
do you change the uh, expansion protocol for younger patients, especially in these patients, the deformity is more easier to, to happen or to occur? Thank you. Okay. okay, so thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, it is true that if you do and you insert the mini implants perpendicular to the palatal plane, although you use only anterior, you can get the bicortical. That's why if I'm doing the MSC in a young patient, I'm talking about 19 years old, I only place the two anteriors and they are bicortical because they are perpendicular, okay? So talking about stability, stability uh, of MARPI, uh, since we always try to get this parallel split, as I said, my occlusion. So stabilization, or, or getting a nice and tight occlusion is what makes uh, my retention really, really well. So I don't do anything special about retention. I, I, I remain, I, um, keep the expander minimum three months after the expansion, of course. And if I can leave the expander, the, the body of the, of the MARPI during the whole treatment, I leave it the whole treatment. I'll, I never know when I'm going to be, when I'm going to need four mini implants in the palate. So I leave it there for the, for the whole treatment, but minimum three months, okay? And uh, the last question was talking about, ah, the nasal deformity. So if we talk about nasal deformity, when, I, when it comes to really young patient, it is true that I don't, I sometimes go one millimeter. It depends on the size of my patient, uh, other, other, other uh, factors, but um, I use the same protocol, uh, one millimeter per, expense per, per day, and I don't change. I only change the protocol if I'm a cleft palate patient. If I'm with a cleft palate patient, in those cases, I really need to make sure that I'm doing exactly the number of turns because I really need to make sure we are getting the parallel speed, but we cannot go too fast because if we go too fast, the connection between the palate and the nasal, the fistula, it will be too big. That's why we need to go slower. So only if cleft palate patient, I go with a, a slower protocol, not for nasal deformity. Okay, thank you. Just a, a question for the, the uh, aligner you are using after the rapid palatal expansion. Uh, uh, first question, for how long you leave the patient before taking the, the scanning for the aligner? The second question, we know that there is spontaneous closure of the diastema even without the treatment. So I, I noticed that you, you, you make uh, like a connection between the centrals, why you are you uh, doing this? Okay, nice question. I like to talk about this because this is a protocol that I use connecting everything together, the MSC and aligners. I like to do this because what you said, if we, we can always do the first, the orthopedic treatment, the expansion, then we can, for example, put a axis, regular axis, and then we do this internal scanner, send to the to the aligner company and get the aligners, okay? That's one thing that you can do. Uh, but I don't do that because what I want to do, I want to take as many advantages as I can do while I'm doing the expansion. So if you do the expansion, you are going to get this spontaneous close. This is spontaneous close may tip my, my teeth in a way that I don't want. So if I do the expansion and I have my aligner because during the expansion, I have an aligner that I cut in the middle and have one side with a liner and the other side with a liner, no movement. So these two segments of the liners are, are holding my denture. So no dental effects, okay? So I'm holding my denture. Second advantage of doing this, I'm going to be able to close my uh, diastema right away because I want to maintain my inside, interincisal papilla. Because if I don't close the diastema right uh, immediately, I will get a really flat papilla and it will have a really um, aesthetic problem at the end. So mm -hmm. um, that's why I can place again with my aligner. I will have an aligner ready after the expansion to close immediately the diastema. And I'm able to place the acrylic tooth. It is true that you need to plan, detailly plan perfectly well how much expansion you want. Because if you plan 10 millimeter expansion and you get 11 millimeter expansion, then you don't have any aligner that will fit in the mouth. So you have to exit, we scan your patient and start over again. But if you get 10 millimeter expansion or less, you can always go for an aligner to start closing the gap. 
That's what I like the combined protocol. So hopefully I can share with you the full protocol, which take me hour and a half minimum. <laughs> yeah. But but there is a problem because the the the, the expansion you are doing in in the in the hierarchs uh, is not uh, related to the exactly to the teeth. Yeah. So 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 you have to do an, another scan. Yeah. That's why I always every every time that I have to do the expansion, every time that I close, of course I need to rescan my patient. But I want to rescan my patient as last as possible, as far as possible. So. It is true that it doesn't be related. So if I get 10 millimeter expansion of my hyrax, I don't get 10 millimeter expansion of my elastema, right? That's why when I plan my case with Invisalign, what I do, I only talk about the stema. I plan the case like a surgical case. Uh, when I talk to the aligner company, I talk how, how many millimeters of the stema I want. I don't even tell them that I'm going to place a Marpy. They don't have to know that. <laughs> they don't care about that. So I only plan the, the diastema that I need. That's why sometimes I'm not, I cannot be accurate because I do the MRP and I clinically decide when I have to stop. Eventually it will be the same as in my digital plan. But if it's not the same, I'm forced to re-scan my patient. Okay? That's why you need to make sure how many expansion you will get and how much the testema will be in order to get a minimum uh, an aligner that fit in mouth. If it's less than the, the amount you get, it will fit. If it's more expansion, then you don't have any aligner that fit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Ramon, we have um, two speakers that would like to take the floor. Mm -hmm. Dr. Riyad Batihi and Dr. Hassan Jabri, uh, JOS, if you'd like to unmute them, please, so they can ask you the questions directly, if you don't mind. Okay. okay. So, uh, so should I have to do to move myself or what? No, you just stay where you are. Okay. So, <laughs> Dr. Riyad Batihi, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. The floor is yours, Doc. Dr. Ramon, thank you for your lectures. First of all, just I want to ask two, 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 two questions. First one, if we do SME, skeletal uh, maxillary expansion, sometimes we have a difficulty in expansion because of thyroid plate connected to the maxilla. And that's yep. why a surgeon try to do some cut in the posterior part to advance the maxilla. So yes. there's... A, Sometimes we have difficulty even with the bicortical uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and expansion that we find some difficulty to expand. And mm -hmm. what we what we have expansion not exactly secretly, just tilting of the bone. The suture does, uh, doesn't open. Okay. This is the question, the first question. The second question is that. Sometimes when, when you do surgical expansion or assisted surgical expansion or MARB, we have a problem, side effects. One of them is that a blurred vision. Sometimes have pain or blurred vision sometimes. It's temporary, but, but the patient are worried about this. Because when you do expansion, like this is critically, sometimes effect or of the frontonasal uh, front suture and the orbit area. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the questions. So yeah, uh, yeah, we, are, we, we, we need to make sure that whenever we talk about MARPI for our patients, we are trying to avoid a surgical procedure. So we cannot warranty them the expansion. Okay, so we are going to do the MARPI because we want to avoid the SARPI. Okay, actually, if I do a SARP, sometimes I, I still do in my SARP when my, when my MSC doesn't work, I have to go for SARP. I still use MSC. So it's a SARP plus MARP. Okay, but uh, it is true that uh, sometimes the main, the main resistance is in the pterygopatin, pterygomaxillary suture. But if you talk to oral surgeons and maxillofacial doctors, they will say, oh, if you can avoid this kind of split doing surgically, 
is better because we have an arteria there. So we don't, they don't want to hit that arteria. That's why um, they always try to avoid that split. But it's true that is the main resistance when we do and when we perform the MARPI. That's why we also have a new, I didn't, I didn't show you today, a procedure that we do in the, in the office, not in a hospital, but we do a mid cital cut. We do with a piezo surgery, which doesn't cut soft tissue. So we do from the uh, ANS to PNS with a really long blade of the uh, piezo surgery. So we go alone. And then if we cannot get the split, even with this, we perform what we call a mini lefort. So we do some split in the vestibular part of the maxilla. However, if we do, do if we do the, the mini lefort, we have a really, mm, we have a problem that those cuts will span only the maxilla. It will not expand the middle third of the face. That means we are not going to have airway impact because my left four are making my maxilla expand, but not my second and my third part of the maxilla expand. Okay, so yeah, but it's true that when the MSC doesn't work, the MARP doesn't work, it's normally because of the pterygopatin suture and also because of the zygomatic buttress. That's why we decided to move a little forward the position of the MEC. It's not anymore two millimeters from the uh, line between the soft tissue and the hard tissue. That's only a reference, a landmark, when we are working with a cast, with a model cast. But if we have a CVSD, we can place right with the lateral vectors, right uh, um, in front of the buttress bone. That will improve the, the expansion protocol, okay? So that's the first question. And the second question, uh, I forgot. About the, the pain and the play of the vision. Oh, yeah. The, the sometimes pain. Patient, they, they have pain from this, and sometimes they have problem in the ear or on the, uh, or in the eyes. There's visions from expansion. Yeah, we have. Especially if you are doing fast expansion. Yeah. It is true that a, regular, a normal uh, pain is the headache. So headache, almost all patients refers to have some headache. Uh, we have uh, published, uh, I think it has been published maybe one year ago, that we don't have uh, a UCLA. Uh, I wasn't involved in that uh, article, but we have in check that we don't have any kind of, in, any kind of uh, change in the orbital uh, bone. That means that we cannot improve and we cannot change any kind in the, in, the, in the eye. So this kind of pain that may be referred in the eye, I think, or my opinion will be that it's some refer pain. So you have pain in your headache and you refer that you have a, a eye headache, a eye, eye ache pain. And uh, related to the ear is more common, it's more frequent because you have to think that your ear is connected to your firing. So when you expand your maxilla, you are going to get more airway, air, air, air flow. So since you have more airflow, you are going to breathe better. And your eustachian uh, tube that, is connect, that connects the ear with the firing is gonna be more expanded. So you can have some uh, weird sensation feeling in your ear, ear. I haven't seen patient that refers pain, but they refer different feelings in the ear. Like when you go in a plane and it goes like. Did you feel some blurred vision? That the patient told you that my vision is not good as before? My ear? After expansion? The, you mean the hearing? The, vision, the vision. vision, vision. Oh, the vision? No, never. Did you have any, any patient? Sometimes the, it is temporary. It is not like, it does not last for, it's temporary for one week, two weeks, and then come back. Well, that's that's really interesting, but uh, could be. You do, what I mean if you do fast, quick expansion, that you open all the sutures, front to nose suture, all the sutures in the anterior part, in the middle part of the face. Sometimes the patient see pain, headache, and air problems and pigeons. It depends on the patient itself. Well, that's uh, I haven't experienced that visual problem. But um, I would love to see those patients and ask them how, why, 
because I haven't, I haven't experienced. I can be, I can think the reason behind this is that you can change by doing the expansion. We, we have changes in the intra, intraocular pressure. It changes and then it adapts. That's why maybe some patients refer that as a pain. I'm not sure. I don't have, I don't have the answer. The last question about we change the bone. Always when we do expansion, we change the bone, we change everything. But we don't change the soft tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, envelope. So sometimes after five or ten years, there will be a relapse. Did you face face like these cases? Relapse after five, ten cases? I have, because you I... changed the bones, but you didn't change the the, the muscular env envelope. Yeah, I see, I see, I see what you what you mean. Yeah, at UCLA we have many patients and they've been done the expansion more than 20 years ago. And it is true that the muscles can have some relapse. So once you do the expansion, you need to wait and you need to see how your patient adapts to this new environment of your mouth. Because it is true that you don't change the envelope. Actually, when we get recessions in the, in the, in the tooth in the, and you see the recession in the gingiva, it is because of a external reception, recession. It doesn't come because you move your teeth out of the bone, out of the alveolar bone. It is because your muscles and your muscular and your mucosa is pulling against the gingiva and that makes a recession. But um, the relapse, again, if you get a good occlusion, it will be minimal. So I cannot be, I, I agree with you that you can get a relapse, but if you have a, a, a nice occlusion, it will be really, really minimum. I mean, at least what I see is that we don't get a, a, that relapse that we get immediately after a regular expansion. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Dr. Riyad, thank you very much, Dr. Ramon. Thank you. That was very informative. What a lovely lecture, beautifully presented. I love the uh, photography skills as well. <laughs> Presentation. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because I, today I wanted to show you what we are doing, so I didn't have to, I cut a lot of slides for my uh, cases, so I don't want to show you what, what we are doing, so hopefully <laughs> I can join you in the future and show you all those cases. It's, it'll be our pleasure. Dr. Mesh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ramon. It's our pleasure. It was a very nice lecture. We look forward, uh, we're going to be a bit greedy. Maybe before the end of the year, we have another lecture from you. Perfect. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, dear, dear colleagues, I would like to thank uh, our guest uh, panelists today, Dr. Samir Sunna, for attending with us this uh, beautiful meeting. Thank you, Dr. Samir. Mm -hmm. And I would like also to thank Dr. Ramon Mompel for, this, for his great effort and beautiful lecture that we're having today. Hopefully, we will have him soon uh, next year in our Congress. Yes. Uh, we are very happy to have you. When we arrange the exact dates, uh, we'll contact you, my friend. Thank you very much thank again, you. and thank, thank you, you so all much. for attending. Please don't forget when you leave the meeting, just to answer the questions for the CME. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Dr. Ramon, Dr. Salma, everybody. You, Dr. Salmer. Thank you so thank much. You, Guys, thank you very Good night. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Okay, ending the meeting now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for the invitation. So it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Stay safe. You too. Bye.